Good afternoon, everybody. I don't need to reintroduce myself. I think the chair gave me a task, uh, two tasks. One is to make sure that after the um, um, midday lunch, we are still awake and enthusiastic. I think you did a good job towards that. And the other is to keep the time. To keep the time is, um, there is an association of, uh, of chairs of various conferences. We, they put me on a wanted list uh, for violating the time. But at this time, I think I, I managed to group the results of my presentation in a way that if you stop me, then at least we have something to discuss. Uh, be that as it may, I think I interpreted the instructions of uh, keeping with the themes of the second day very broadly, and I would likely mm, stick more to the overall theme, the role of science and um, the role of research. And um, that's why I will present some of, of um, the work that we did under the state of food insecurity in the world on, on family farming innovation for farming, farming a couple of years ago, and some, some other issues that, that are related to that. So um, in the process, and I think I, I agreed on this with one of the organizers, if that's okay, I think it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting, uh, some interesting facts, and having been in this room continuously, um, I now uh, inclined to say that it's, it's good to, for some of those things to be communicated because being agricultural researchers, sometimes we ignore them. And it's the whole issue of diversity and the challenges that it presents for research science and, uh, and, and, and uh, capacity development uh, for all of us. So without further ado, I would use the family farming as an entry point to come to some more of the issues just talked about. So uh, the main messages of the report were that, um, you know, uh, family farms are the dominant form of farming, uh, but there is a huge diversity, as we will see in a bit. Uh, they are essential for the basic themes of, let's say, the post-2015 uh, sustainable development goals, food security, poverty, sustainable natural resource management. What do we call the new concepts of sustainability? Um, we can achieve several goals through innovation and family farming, but um, and that's why I conclude that the, 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 the research and, and um, dissemination system is not ready for this challenge yet. And so that's, that would be the, the final conclusion. How many farms do we have in this world? Nobody ever took the time to calculate it until we put our hands on the sofa. Who would just try to make a wild guess? How many farms? And then I would tell you how they've been calculated. Well, according to us at least, there are about more than 507 million farms in the world. And that, that piece of information comes out of the analysis of agricultural census reports. You can't put your hands on the original census data. It's very difficult, they're not available. But the reports show you that there are about more than 570 million farms that comes out of a sample of 170 countries. And I'm saying 570 is, be, uh, uh, um, I say more than, is because if you look at latest censuses that don't exist uh, for, for a lot of the countries, then you see that the number of farms is increasing. But we're going to go to that later on. So where are they located? 47% of them in the upper middle income countries, 36% in the lower middle income countries, and only 4% in the high income countries. This is... Um, uh, uh, the, the sta our starting point. Now, you, if you want to see where the regional distributions uh, is, that you see that 59% of them uh, are uh, located in India and China. And then um, if you put that the rest of Asia in, uh, you have a big chunk of, of uh, world farms um, situated in Asia. And only 9% in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, 90% of those farms are considered family farms. And what is a family farm? The first, the first obstacle that we had to overcome is to, uh, to identify what is the family farm. We found about 36 definitions in the literature on what family farm is. And so we decided, instead of putting a cap on the acreage, on the, on the hectares, if you wish, of family farms, to consider two parameters to define a family farm. One is management 
ownership slash management. Not all censuses are clear about this. And the other is the use of family labor. So a farm that's managed by an individual or a family uh, is a family farm, uh, but it also has to fulfill the uh, requirement that the most of the labor used on the farm is family labor. And, and the censuses will give you that, but not to the same degree. And while we have 170 censuses that on which we can calculate the uh, number of farms, we have about 60 to calculate uh, the, uh, the, the family farms, and then we have to project. So we have nine, 500 million family farms, which they operate about 75% of farmland. This is our calculations. You may question it. You can ask me how we got all this, but that's what uh, it came from the Census Bureau. By the way, uh, because we are a very democratic institution, very soon in the uh, Journal of World Development, there will be two papers on which members of the FAO, of staff of FAO are involved in both of them, and they will have two different definitions of family farms. And then you see on the same issue, two papers, two different definitions, and how some of the results change. I chose the one uh, that we had in the state of food and agriculture. Now, what's striking about this, and I think this is the meat of this presentation, is uh, the diversity of farms in the world. You know, if you take the farms by land class size, you will see that between, uh, that about 84% of all farms are less than two hectares. That's pretty amazing, but it will be more amazing what I'll show you next. 10% is between two and five hectares, and then 2% of uh, uh, world farms is larger than 20 hectares, right? And a small percentage of it is above 50. Now, however, if you look at the uh, distribution of farms by farm size and how much land they control is absolutely astounding. So you have 84% of farms controlling 12% of land, of um, available land, again, according to the censuses, while you have um, a, a small number of farms, more than 20 hectares, um, that uh, control uh, a huge amount of land, right? Now, this diversity throws a monkey wrench in our efforts to create support systems on innovation, on research, on extension, et cetera, for farms. Because not all, all those farms have the same types of needs in terms of these um, important uh, services. Now, not only they're small, but they're becoming smaller, uh, especially in low and middle income countries. And somehow this one is, I think, I hope is, is the right version of the presentation. In any case, um, so as you see here in middle and, um, and, th and, and it's not straightforward to calculate this, um, and there is a good reason that only a limited number of countries are, um, are reported. Uh, you see that, let's say, in low-income countries, in 12 of them, there is a decrease in the average size of farms. Uh, uh, the same thing for low- and middle-income countries uh, and upper-middle-income countries, while in high-income countries, there is the average. Uh, there, in 25 countries, the average size of farms are increased. So um, that... This is a curiosum, right? Some people will interpret it differently. Mike Lipton will tell you it's because small is beautiful and small farms are more um, productive than large farms. So people convert to something that is more productive. Well, wait a second, and then we'll see if that's the case. Others want to interpret it that it's subdivision of farmland because people don't have other alternatives to go and do something different. It's the whole blockage to the agricultural transformation. Now. Um, there are other elements of uh, uh, diversity in family farms. This is a complicated picture. Don't try to interpret it. I will do it for you. What it says, it says that if you take farm households, right, they're pluriactive. And that's where I, when I mentioned in the beginning of my talk that there were quite a bit of, of, of um, uh, presentations in this room here, which practically hinted at farming as a single activity of households, which I think I'm glad that I show you this slide. Look at the diversity here is, uh, we have a big database in FAO that, that took us a few years to build uh, on the sources of rural income, right? And this is a part of this 
of this database. It shows you, if you, if you have the patience to analyze it, that the smaller the farm is, the higher the percentage of income that comes from non-farm activities, right? I mean, even, and, and if, you, if, you, if, you, um, if you translate this into income classes instead of accurate classes, then you get pretty much the same result. The poorest households, rural households, they, uh, drive, they, they draw acti uh, income from non-farm activities, right? This issue of diversification is, is also um, a, a, another issue that, that, um, that, that flies in all of our faces to try to see how we can exploit more than agricultural entry points into poverty reduction, right? And which sometimes we don't even consider. It, it is not delinked from priorities for agricultural research. So hopefully we have time to come to that uh, on the discussion. So this is one type of diversity and complexity that one has to take into account. Now, the famous uh, saying, small is beautiful, and that small farms are more efficient than large farms is correct when you talk about yields. That is, rich, let's say, uh, the, the productivity of land. Um, this is correct because a lot of family members on a small farm work on it and make it productive. However, where the catch is, and that's another issue that, um, that single-minded research on yields and productivity of land tends to ignore, is the fact that um, the labor productivity, and here is some country examples, uh, which is the value of agricultural production per worker per day. You can, even if you take the value added, uh, which you cannot do it from surveys, um, it gives you the same results. It's low for low for smaller farms, right? So, but, but at the end of the day, the ticket out of poverty is the labor productivity. The, the catch with this is that the issue of increasing labor productivity and farm wage is not always linked to agriculture itself, but to a more generalized research that will identify the core and the root causes of, of, of poverty, and to what extent agriculture can be used as an entry point. And this is the same thing for the countries where multiple, um, multiples of, of labor productivity in, in high-income countries as compared to low-income countries. You can replace um, the uh, value of agricultural production with the value added of agriculture, that is the GD, agricultural GDP, and you get exactly the same result. It doesn't make any difference. Finally, in, I don't want to, to be seen here that, that agriculture-based research is not relevant. If you look at, at the, um, the total factor productivity, and this is uh, some work that's done by Fugli uh, that I'm sure a lot of you know, you see here that um, the, 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 the top part of the, unfortunately the, the legend is missing, uh, the top part of every bar is the unexplained, if you wish, um, uh, the percentage in productivity that doesn't come from the increase in inputs. So the yellow, I don't remember now what, the, the yellow is uh, increases in land, uh, the other is increases in variable inputs like fertilizer, the other is mechanization, and the top part is the exact productivity. That is, the innovation, what comes out of research, what comes of better combination of inputs, etc. What you get from research. So if you look at the lower, um, low income countries, that's a very small part of growth, right? Well, for high income countries, you can explain the agricultural output growth pretty much to research and innovation. So there is quite a bit of room for agricultural research to improve that, um, that uh, light green component for the developing and low income countries. So I don't want to be seen that I so, what do we have so far? First of all, we need a research agenda that corresponds to the diversity I just described. And of course, this is other kinds of diversity. You can talk about gender, uh, diversity, and the particular needs, etc. I just picked some of the big things uh, to, to, uh, to put here uh, in front of you. There is uh, beyond yield enhancing technologies because labor productivity is very low. Then there is Several entry points, since we're talking about the MDGs, the, sorry, the SDGs and the post-2015, uh, if you really want to make a, a clean break in rural poverty reduction, then you have to look at the various entry points over and beyond 
agriculture. That's the other key message, I think, that comes out of this analysis. But there is still a strong case for agricultural innovation agenda, agriculture as in agriculture, uh, right, as uh, it comes evident from the, um, from the slide on total factor productivity. Now, if you go back to the discussion of, of uh, family farms, um, you can, you can group this into infinite categories, but let's say three, let's say three categories. One is the large lab, uh, family farms. The large family farms are well integrated into the innovation system because of a lot of it comes from private research. Um, they have the funds and the capital, et cetera, to, to deal with risk. And so what they need from the public sector, because this is what we're going to focus today on the public sector governance of research, um, is you know, a, a conducive environment, functioning markets, uh, uh, conducive institutions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The usual, the usual suspect for a development agenda. For the smaller, medium-sized farm, I think that this is the key, um, the key recipient where the, the, the public research system can do a, 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 fundamental, um, a fundamental change uh, for the better. Um, some of them are already commercial, which means they already generate a surplus, and some of them are not, but they do have the, poten the potential to become commercial if the innovation is promoted through the research and, 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 and research dissemination, right? So this small um, group is, is extremely important for the purposes of, of achieving the, 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 the goals that we are all talking about. Now, the problem is, what do you do with the small subsistence smallholders with little or, pot uh, or no potential for uh, commercial production? This is a good question. I'm sure there is not just one size fits all. All the non-commercial subsistence um, farmers are doomed to. Um, are, however, uh, agriculture innovation for a lot of those categories would make a very small difference, right? So the question is, what else is needed? And the what else, you're going to find out by looking at their areas on which they are active. What is it that they do? It's, so it's beyond productivity of agriculture as such. It's labor productivity in the rural areas, right? That's, and so that's what the point is. And some of it, maybe we should sometimes say it out loud, right, with the risk of being fired. We should look about the agricultural transition, the transition out of agriculture. Because if we ignore it, it's in any case going to happen. And instead of leading to better outcomes, it would lead to better misery in the cities or somewhere else. So we have to find the proper pathways out of poverty for these people in which agricultural innovation may contribute to very little. The potential is, is, is very small. So this is the, the, the diversity now in terms of the research and innovation agenda. Now, innovations, uh, what is, the, there is, an innovation system is not just research and extension, although unfortunately this is the data that we have and that's what we, we're going to talk about. But it's the, the, it's the, the innovation system includes all those institutions and individuals that enable farmers to innovate. And those institutions are actually increasing. We are not in the Green Revolution, I will show you a slide now, where things were fairly simple. I have five minutes, that's complicated. Now, um, so we are, not, we are not in the Green Revolution agenda. Now, who is involved today in research and this nebulous concept of innovation? That is the state, there is the private sector, there is the civil society, there is the philanthropic foundation, there is a multiplicity of actors, the CG system, et cetera, FAO, et cetera, no? So it's a complicated nexus of those that are, let's say, providers or promoters of innovation. And so this, the complexity of this system, I claim, it still needs uh, a governance led by the public agricultural research. So, now, is the innovation system as we have it today fit for this change, right? What the contribution is? I'd say no, but you can have your different opinion. Let's say, if you take the sustainable development goals, I would say FAO defines sustainability uh, in three, as a three-pronged 
um, let's say, a, a monster. Environmental, social, and economic. And different groups of countries will place different priorities in these components of sustainability. Go, for example, in the Agriculture for Development Report of the World Bank in 2018, you will see there that different categories of countries place greater emphasis on environment, some greater emphasis on, 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 uh, on uh, production uh, or poverty reduction. Now, the world of the Green Revolution, as I said, uh, it's not there anymore. There we had a single-minded, if you wish, priority to increase yields, right? To, to, to make sure the world doesn't starve. There was a, a lot of public research for public goods. There was a strategy for international dissemination of results. There is a um, national strategy for national capacity development. Um, there were no IPRs um, and few regulatory hurdles. And now we come to, if you take point by point, this Green Revolution agenda is all changed. It's all become extremely more complicated. You have IPRs. You have um, the necessity that countries maintain regulatory and, and, and legal frameworks for some of the more modern um, gene uh, technology, etc. cetera. Uh, Rodomiro is here? Yes, I'm sure he will agree. However, the agriculture R&D, but it doesn't take place, a lot of it doesn't take place where it should. And if you look at it, 13% of uh, public expenditure in agriculture is in the United States. Only 6%, in, which has, of course, a tremendous amount of, of research uh, and R&D by the private sector. I mean, I'm talking about a public R&D here, right? Only 6% um, in sub-Saharan Africa and 35% in general in high-income countries. So where you have the problem, you don't have the proper amount. And this is a different, um, it, it's, it's the same thing uh, with a different statement. It's the, 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 um, the agriculture intense intensity, which is the expenditures on, on, on GDP. So look at the low-income countries vis-a-vis -vis the high-income countries, the world average, et cetera, right? Very, very, very low uh, R&D intensity. Now, first of all, what would the, uh, the, the basics uh, of, uh, of a proper, quote-unquote, governance of the R&D system would be? First of all, there is a lot of R&D, public R&D, that deals with public goods that private sector would never do whether that's called orphan crops, gender-sensitive technology, food safety, environmental sustainability, and, gui and, and, and guidelines, et cetera. Those are things that are that, that not going to be gotten by the private sector. The international cooperation should be used to the extent possible. Basic research belongs possibly not to the developing countries. Adaptive research belongs to the developing countries. That's the principles of the governance uh, of the R&D. The, 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 the new thinking on, on agriculture R&D is that you should combine indigenous farmer knowledge with the latest uh, results of science. This is something which, um, uh, that, that they act as uh, complementary to each other. And then inclusive and participatory research is a question because it has worked in some places and it hasn't worked in others. Just for your information, the next state of food and agriculture will be on the governance of the public research system which addresses some of those questions. Is participatory research bearing fruits and where? Uh, I'm, I suppose I don't have time to go to the agricultural extension um, issue, but just to tell you that uh, most of the uh, extension systems in the developing countries have collapsed, especially after some development experiments of a few years ago, um, and they need to be put back in place. Actually, until IFPRI started the ASTI program, to try to calculate the um, expenditures of countries on, on extension, we didn't even have, we had a huge positive on an organized body of data on extension, which we call the dissemination uh, process. So again, you have the, 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 the demand on the, on the dissemination system is huge. It's not just about yields, as I said before. It's, it's, it mirrors the, uh, the research system, right? Um, at, and so uh, the, the, the key question of making services available to small family farms, especially remote areas, et cetera, when there is no economies of scale to be made is, is an open question. Now, finally, and I'm not going to elaborate on this, we see that um, the capacity to innovate 
it has three different levels uh, in general. First of all, is what I called when I talked about the, the various classifications of needs, um, uh, the, the enabling environment, like right? the appropriate policies, um, access to markets, which is fundamental for, for adoption uh, of innovation, uh, the organizations and institutions. Then is the organizational dimension, which refers to the public, private, and civil society organizations and how they can contribute to the innovation system. That is, from farmers' organizations to private sector, chambers of commerce, etc., to diffuse and produce innovation. And finally is the individual dimension, the farmers themselves, which the extension system for years and the research uh, it was targeted. So this is my presentation. Thank you very much. I took a little longer. Uh, and here is some of the places you can find more information. You can stay. Thank you. you can stay. Uh, thank you very much, Costas. I think, I mean, you, you were almost perfect, so we should take you down from that wanted list, I, I clearly must say. But please stay. It means that actually there are ah. some questions. You know, some, some speakers have that as, as, a, as a method to try to speak their whole time and avoid the questions. Not possible here. Okay. You, just one, one warm-up question from me. You, you, you stated that, you know, in terms of um, the research really focusing on family farming, one, one innovative way now is to much more in involve the family farmers, I mean the yeah. farmers themselves, uh, traditional systems and so on, together with the research. How do you do that in practical terms? I mean, farmers in general, and especially in, in, this, in these conditions, it doesn't, they don't have a lot of extra time to spend on researchers. How do you do it in a practical way? How do you involve people at that level? Um, you know, you're touching on a very sensitive nerve, right? On, there was a, a big, before this um, um, participation of uh, farmers in this uh, effort, there was this big discussion between TVA, you know, training visit and other systems, the farmer field schools that mm. FAO promoted in countries. Um, it, they, it's, there is no, I mean, farmers will, make the time available for the things they know they're going to produce something good. That's part of the... You, you see, farm households have strategies, right? That they include farming, migration, working in the city, etc. right? Part of those strategies include in absorbing mm. new messages. Et of course, in this case, the farmer organizations are key. Mm. The civil society organizations, they go visit farmers that are remote in order to pass the message to them, right? So you have or to get from them. So there is this, the, the, these kinds of organizations, the middle part of my big diagram are key in mm. order to do exactly what you mm. say. Just very quickly also, I mean, we, we hear a lot uh, on uh, new technologies, uh, you know, digital te technologies that means that, that, you know, you can connect in a completely different way than you did before with, with markets and so on, through mobile phones, etc. Do you see that this is, uh, these are technologies that will actually transform uh, the situation for the smallest farms? Or um, is it still above their heads, sort of? I wish there was one single technology that would transform the agricultural sector to something we would like mm. to see. The first evaluation of the mobile uh, phones, etc., as, uh, as instruments for market information, etc., they've been quite good. But scaling up, in some cases, uh, it's, it, it's a challenge. Mm. Uh, again, I don't think there is one technology that would transform agriculture. Mm. Um, it's, 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 and, and then there, there is one more issue, right, which we didn't mention, but lingers in the background. What is the incentive for a farmer to adopt the technology? Mm. Because there is a lot of stuff on the shelf. I mean, look at, if, if you look at the technologies achieved in the experiment stations, for the same crop, in the same agroecological areas, um, the actual versus the potential technology can be five times higher in terms mm. of yields. Mm. So it's not the lack of technology, right? It's the, it's the incentives for adoption. Huge, yeah. What is the share of price that a farmer gets, let's say, from the port to the farm? Mm. It's 5%, 10%? It makes a difference if it's 10% or if it's 40%. So the incentives are there, which include risks associated with the technology, etc. We know what are the appropriate technologies that, for instance, will contribute to mitigation um, mm. or adaptation to climate change, right? Why they don't get adopted? It's because they're extremely risky. Mm. They have a high startup cost, and nobody, either people don't have the capital or they don't want to risk mm. it 
to adopt it. So there is a, a big framework there. And a lot of uncertainty still, right. yes, exactly. So please, uh, two, three comments or questions. Uh, and if you can't respond to everything now, we can keep them also for the panel. Please, do you have a microphone? Oh, no, no. Oops, here we go. Thank you, Costas. Excellent. The, the, the low productivity when it comes re related to labor time in, in the small family farming, how, how bad is that really? Is, is, I mean, is there a pull to industrial or alternative works? Is, is it really, it, it is a big catastrophe that they spend so much time into increasing their production? Do you see what I'm saying? Um, it uh, I'm not sure it's a catastrophe, but certainly the, the labor productivity is what determines the agricultural wage at the end of the day, right? I mean, it's but the returns to the farm labor, whether one works in a farm or works on their own farm. So you have more people working on, on a piece of land that you would actually um, use. You see, there, there, are two, there are two types of efficiency, just to speak as a, as a, a little bit more as an economist. There is the, the technical efficiency and the allocative efficiency. The technical efficiency is how much, let's say, you get from your land. The allocative efficiency is do you really put the optimal amount of resources and do you really cultivate the right crop relative to what could give you an optimal return? And so what we know now is that from um, serious case studies is that the, the technical efficiency of small farms is higher than the technical efficiency of large farms F in the same context, in the same uh, conditions, right? Or similar conditions. However, the allocative efficiency is small, and it has to do with risk. Um, it has to do with lack of alternative opportunities, etc. So I don't know if it's a catastrophe, but unless you resolve that, it will be very difficult to resolve the, the issue of, of agricultural mm. poverty. Okay. Thank you very much. I think you gave uh, an extraordinary good picture of the complexity, not least, in terms of uh, the research trying to address many of the questions of small farmers. And what is interesting, if, I don't know the numbers exactly, but my understanding is that, you know, the five, okay, you talk about 500 million small, smaller family farms, but altogether we talk about 2.2 2 .2 billion people. Um, so it's, it's, a good uh, calculation it's, well. a lot, it's a lot of people, I mean, in terms of employment and so on. So uh, it's, it's really a lot more than just the 500 Correct. million farms also. Correct. So thank you very much, Costas. Very good.